Hi, my name is Nancy Schreiber. I'm a cinematographer, director of photography, and you are listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today, we invite cinematographer Nancy Schreiber on the show to talk about her career and latest film, Maplethorpe. Nancy and I discuss shooting on film, navigating tight production budgets, the reality of being a woman in the film industry, and much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, buy, rent, create at rule.com, Hedge.video, the fastest way to back up media, Shutterstock.com, Magnanimous Rentals, and PremiumBeat.com. Hello and welcome back to Go Creative Show. Thank you guys for coming here and listening week after week. We've got Nancy Schreiber on the show today. Nancy Schreiber is a legend in this industry. She's been doing it a long time. She's got tons of great stories, worked on a whole bunch of excellent films. Of course, she's here today talking about Maplethorpe, and we're going to dive deep into that one in just a couple of minutes. I want to alert you guys to a couple of things. First, we've got a survey going on on our website. If you go to gocreativeshow.com, click on survey. You, by completing the survey, have a chance to win a $100 gift card to B&H. Uh, we're doing it because we want to know more about our audience. We want to know what you like, what you don't like. Uh, if you have any suggestions of what we should do better or different, we want to hear from you. And there's a whole bunch of ways that you can speak to us. Of course, our Facebook page, our, our new Instagram at Go Creative Show on Instagram, uh, on Twitter, we're there too. Uh, but this is just yet another way to really dive deep into what it is about Go Creative Show that you like uh, and maybe things that you don't like. We want to hear it all. And you get a chance to win a $100 gift card to B&H. So why not take advantage of that? It's super easy. GoCreativeShow.com and click on survey. Oh, and I have some even bigger news. I don't know if you guys heard, but our sponsor, Hedge, Hedge.video, they just bought PostLab. Now, this is huge news for Final Cut Pro 10 users and for other NLEs, too, eventually. Um, but PostLab allows teams of editors to collaborate on Final Cut 10 projects with version control, file sharing, and commenting. So for those of you Final Cut 10 people like me, like the whole team here at BC Media Productions, this is a big deal. Now, of course, uh, hedge.video forward slash go creative show is where you go to learn all about what Hedge is. They're a backup software for filmmakers. Uh, they make it super easy. It's very fast. You can import multiple sources, send it to multiple destinations at the same time. Uh, they're constantly updating the app. So when you buy your license, have no fear. You're going to be getting those great updates as well. And they have all sorts of different licenses that you can buy. Now, at hedge.video forward slash go creative show, when you purchase a full license, you get 20% off simply by typing in go creative show in the coupon code at checkout. So there's all of that. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to check that out. But the fact that they just bought PostLab is a big deal. And that means that this company is growing. This company is changing. And they're buying more really interesting things to make all of our lives easier on the post-production side. And that's why we love those guys. So check them out. Hedge.video forward slash go creative show. All right. Time to dive in to our interview with Nancy Schreiber. So I'm here with Nancy Schreiber. She's a cinematographer and director of photography of Maplethorpe and so much more. Nancy, thank you so much for being on the Go Creative Show. Thank you, Ben, for having me. I have a confession to make, Nancy, and I'm embarrassed by this. I didn't know who Robert Maplethorpe was. It's awful because I feel like I should have. And when I saw the photos, I recognized them. I just didn't know who that person was. And wow, am I so happy to have seen this film and learned who he was and seen more of his work. It's incredible. Yeah, and uh, I think it's a lot of people, you know, you're younger, just didn't know because there was such a controversy um, at the time. I mean, basically, the, the, the controversy was, is it pornography or That's is right. it art? And, exactly. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting conversation to have. And what, I mean, when you look at his work now, in hindsight... Of course it's art. I mean, it's it's absolutely beautiful. And yes, it's pornography as in there are naked people on it uh, right. in the art, but it just doesn't feel that way when you see it. It doesn't have the same feel as pornography. 
I mean, but you, you were around at this time when this art was happening. You were in New York when yeah. he was when he was thriving and his career was blossoming. Did you were, were you kind of paying attention to what was going on with him at the time? Oh, I certainly knew of him and his work. I don't remember being shocked by anything. You know, I, the artists of the time were really revolutionary, and he was just part of that. Whether it was dance or film, uh, you know, he was part of, a, I won't say avant-garde exactly, but uh, he was... Uh, certainly an original and nobody has since been like him or what nor, nor was anybody uh, doing the kind of work he did before and what's interesting is people knew who he was i mean he had a great career shooting stills portraits of famous people uh and also his flowers in particular the black and white flowers are really extraordinary and erotic so it, it yeah. you know uh, he brought eroticism into all of his work. There was a scene in the film. I don't remember the exact line, but it was something to the effect of like, we'll let them buy the photos of the, of the um, flowers, not knowing what it is that they're displaying or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, and it's interesting. We, for 10 seconds thought about shooting in black and white that really didn't go very far. Uh, hmm. And I think uh, because Maplethorpe did work in color, he did work do some flowers in color, but he's known for the, all of his black and white work, whether it's the flowers or his homoerotic work. So the film is called Maplethorpe. It's a, it's a look at the life of photographer Robert Maplethorpe and his rise to fame and his, you know, un, untimely death in 1989. Um, the film is beautiful. It's really well acted. It's really well directed and well shot. I mean, it, the work that you did on this, Nancy, is absolutely beautiful. I want to talk about your research on Robert Maplethorpe leading up to the film, because you're now doing something. It's not a documentary, but, you know, it's a life story. And there's this huge uh, amount of information out there about him, his artwork, the stories made about him. Um, how, how are you preparing for the film and did you really dig into Robert and his work leading up to it? I had looked at several books that are about Robert. Of course, I knew the history of the times. Many of my friends had died of AIDS. Uh, it was, you know, New York was a really <sighs> wonderful and difficult place to be living in the 80s. Um, great art scene, music scene, thriving, uh, and yet there was this pall of death. You just, every week, somebody else you knew had AIDS or was dying of it. Mm. And so it was a really emotional time. I, I, I think a lot of younger people don't realize that New York it hasn't always been Disney. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's very, it was very, very different, and not even that long ago, I mean, relatively right. speaking. It's changed so much in the past 50 years, 40 years. It's it's insane. It's insane. And in fact, uh, the number of new buildings really made our lives difficult because we couldn't show anything that was built after the uh, 80s. So <laughs> we uh, had a hard time even shooting in Manhattan, number one, because of the amazing amount of construction. Mm hmm and number two, because film production has been so uh, abundant in the last few years that there's a moratorium on shooting in many of the areas in downtown where Robert lived. Yeah. So we uh, actually, and the Chelsea Hotel was under renovation, and uh, we ended up shooting um, the interiors up in Yonkers in the Bronx at this old manor house and uh, did the best we could. <laughs> well, you, the... you certainly did a fantastic job with it. I mean, it, you there, it, every frame of that film feels like the time period that it's in, which I know obviously is the goal of a period piece, but it isn't always executed so well. And I think a lot of that has to do with the choices that you made in the camera 
and in the lenses. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that for us now. How did you establish this really unique, really compelling look of the film? Both Andy and I wanted to shoot in film. There was no digital cinema. Yes, there was video production, uh, especially, you know, news and some documentaries, but even documentaries were being shot in 16 millimeter or super 16. Uh, uh, Andy had a relationship with Kodak because she's a proponent and shoots with some super eight in her films. Mm. I certainly came up in film and, uh, It was just like being able to work with an old friend. I had uh, a 16 millimeter camera. It's still in my closet. Nice. Uh, (laughs) But, uh, you know, so I came up in that world and uh, it was wonderful that we were able to work not only with Kodak, but with uh, a local New York rental house to find the most update cameras, which were Airy 416s. Um, I was an Aton owner uh, because at that point, the uh, Airy SR was very uncomfortable for my shoulder. I have thin shoulders, bones, and uh, the Airy had a plate on the bottom that was really uncomfortable. Um, And many of us in New York bought the French camera, the Aton. And uh, However, when this 416 came out, which is the littler version of the Aton, really, it's shaped in the same way. Uh, It was a revolutionary camera, and yet Aeroflex stopped promoting any film cameras because then the Alexa came out in a digital revolution. Yeah. So we were lucky to find two of them at a rental house called TCS family-owned, um, two brothers uh, own it, the Scheidingers, and uh, I had bought equipment from their dad. The, this company's been in business for 40 years. Uh, I remember uh, their dad, who was German, was the first person to bring in Sackler, Sackler tripod, so I bought wow. a Sackler from him. I remember I bought a Zeiss 10 to 100 Zoom for my 16 camera. So, you know, they were a family business. I was happy to be there. And uh, the brothers, Eric and Oliver, really uh, go out of their way to help us cinematographers find unusual lenses. And uh, it it made sense, even though I've been mostly uh, a Panavision person, uh, all of the 416s Panavision owns were on Walking Dead, which shoots right here in Atlanta in yeah. Super 16. Um, I must say, because there were budget issues, that Andy and I really had to fight to keep film alive in the film. You know, we had to do budgeting, and there would have been no way for us to shoot in Super 16 had Kodak not opened a lab in New York. Mm. Because the only lab still standing was Photochem in California, and we were not going to be able to ship because of the cost and time delay. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you kind of how you landed on uh, Kodak 16 because it's like, I mean, obviously it makes sense with the time period and it's going to look great, but you know, budget constraints. This was a small film with yeah. with very little time. I mean. Right. I, I can imagine that being a challenge, but how did, I guess, how did you finally get the powers that be to say, okay, we'll let you do this? And was it well, grudgingly? <laughs> they sort of no, like, oh, not at all. Okay. You know, you have to understand that people think film is more expensive, mm. but we had a smaller crew. I didn't have a DIT. There was nobody downloading. It's true. Uh, you know, so crew wise, it was smaller. Um, in fact, film is very fast to work in. Video Village, these taps, because nobody updated uh, film cameras, the video taps are like standard def. So like the olden days, nobody cared too much about the monitors, which are the god of digital oh, yeah. cinema. You know, I'm stuck behind them. That's where I'm creating the images now. But I was using my eye to light. Uh, I had generally only one camera 
which I operated. And uh, it was just really fast. I could move very quickly. Uh, also, there's incredible latitude in shooting film, with especially in the high in the highlights, looking out windows. What you see is so much more interesting, and uh, uh, and you see so much more in film, even to this day. You know, certainly, you know, I'm an Alexa user. I've used all the cameras. I'm, I say I'm camera agnostic. Um, and that's good. You, you know, yeah. that, that's a, that's, that's what everyone strives to be for sure. There are a lot of choices and it's only a tool yeah. and it's what you do with the lenses and the lighting. I came out of lighting. So, uh, anyway, working in film, we proved that it wasn't that much more expensive. That's encouraging to hear. Um, I, I think one thing that stands out to me is that the fact that you're not monitoring the way that people do now, um, I mean, just the listeners out there just, and, and, you know, myself included, I'm thinking to myself, if I only had an SD feed, I have to really, really trust that cinematographer. I have to, I mean, the amount of trust that I have, because already now in situations today, you know, clients will come in, they'll look at the monitor for two seconds and make some comment that is completely irrelevant just because the monitor, maybe they're seeing it from the wrong angle and something looks washed out. They are expecting what they see on the monitor to be it. And- To have that stripped down to SD, wow, you got to make sure that that cinematographer is your trusted companion in this filmmaking industry. And um, certainly you are. But what is it like from your point of view, knowing that the people watching at the monitor really aren't seeing what you're seeing? Well, the people at the monitor, mon- you know, let me just say when I started in the business as an electrician and then gaffer, there were no video tabs. Mm. So people really did trust the operator cinematographer. I mean, I was lucky to be able to operate. That's how I came up in the business. But now, for example, on this television series, I'm running two cameras all the time. And the monitors, as I said, <laughs> the monitors are the gods. And so yes. I am by there, the, the monitors working out my look um, and uh exposure, color, making those decisions that then go through the the pipeline. Um, Back when we were shooting films every year, Kodak would put out a new film stock and we cinematographers would test. And there was a lot of trust. Uh, And so it's interesting because now power has shifted in terms of the visuals. And uh, people don't know what to expect because they, the film has to go into the processing, into the lab, and who knows what it'll be like. And, you know, we cinematographers have tested and have skills, and it's not, we don't believe in fixing it in post. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's a different having, world. It is. Now, I have to say there was one drawback. The film stocks are very slow. And we are used to these days shooting never below 800 ISO. We called it ASA back in the day. Uh, I'm looking for a grittier look on this television show I'm doing here. I'm shooting at 1600 ISO. Mm. So film, the fastest stock is 500 ISO. Wow. However, I wanted rich blacks and it was so grainy that I ended up rating it at 400 with my daylight interior stock 250 daylight. I also overexposed. And so my, I had a 200 ISO, which you need a ton of light. Yeah, you really do. And, uh, it was that was kind of shocking. Now, <laughs> to remember that we used to work that way, and I think of the cinematographers way back when the stocks were fifty ASA, a oh, hundred mostly. When I started, it was a hundred ASA. When I was an electrician, that was the fastest. So, what did your lighting package look like? I mean, you're you got to move fast. You only have yeah. so many days, and you're shooting with film that requires a lot of light. <laughs> you know. Well, day doing? interior, I had uh, small HMIs mm-hmm. and uh, 
large tungsten phrenite exterior. Uh, I did use some HMI as well. And uh, I used uh, Zeiss Super Speed lenses, 35 millimeter, that are all the rage now when you're yeah. shooting digital because they make the image presentable. Yeah. Because digital can be very unkind to humans. Um, <laughs> and so I did do a lot of testing of lenses before we started. And even though we were a Super 16, the 35 Super Speeds were just better than the 16s in terms of resolution. Um, and, of course, they're fast. So I was able to uh, <laughs> have enough light to not feel too overlit. <laughs> yes. Do you use any zoom lenses? I did use two vintage zooms. One, which was used at the time in documentaries, a 6.6 to 66 Canon. Hmm. And I did for day exterior, that's when I used the zooms, use uh, an Ingenue 25 250 HR it's a beautiful lens. I've even used it in digital. Uh, it's very crisp and the, the color is pretty saturated. The black levels really are strong. And uh, the problem with the lens, I remember when I was doing some friends, very small digital films, we could afford the, that 25 250 HR, but um, it breathes when uh, you pull focus. So you have to be very careful. Yeah. But it was just perfect for this film and cut beautifully into it. What was your process in processing this film? Well, first of all, we had tested and uh, the lab had opened just a couple months before um, Spielberg on um, The Post was the first film to go through there. And then Crashing, the HBO series, amazingly was shooting in 35 millimeter. Really? And then when we were processing, uh, Scorsese was testing for The Irishman. So it was very busy at this lab. In fact, they had to buy a new processor. Now, the equipment was extremely modern. It came out of UK. These process These processors were not the old processors uh, from the past. Uh, so it was brand new. And uh, the lab was in Long Island City. And I remember walking in and the smell of the chemicals it was just, again, like the the memories I'd had yeah. of so many years of being in film labs. So it was very familiar and comforting. Uh, so our film was processed and uh, then the nag was taken to Technicolor Postworks in New York City, Lower Manhattan, not far from where Robert lived. Yeah. And uh, they scanned to 2K only and made our dailies. Uh, we thought maybe if, when we did some VFX, because we sometimes did have to take out some new buildings, and also we had to put New York City into the window of the room in the Chelsea where Robert and Patty lived. Yeah. Uh, we thought maybe we would be going to 4K, but it never happened. Partly budget, I'm sure. What if I told you that right now I can get an Alexa Mini for three days for less than $1,000? That is insane, but it's true. I go to magrents.com. I do it every day because I always want to see what they have going on. And magrents.com has a flash discount right now uh, for an Alexa Mini. And I, I put in the dates. I threw it in my car just to see how much it would be. And it was 900 bucks for three days. Now, that's crazy. Now, here's the thing. Magnanimous Rentals is an equipment rental house. Okay, They're based in Chicago, but they ship anywhere in the country. And they've got an excellent inventory. But the big thing with them is their prices. Okay, You cannot beat their prices. So even their regular prices are great, but they have these things called flash discounts, which is what this Alexa Mini was just today. And a flash discount is a steeply, deeply reduced price. But it's only a limited time, though. Sometimes the prices are cut like almost by 50%. 
But the key here is it's limited time. So if you go to magrents.com now, you, you may not see that Alexa Mini that I'm talking about. So don't get mad at me because what you need to do is go to magrents.com every day and see what they have available. Like I said, their regular prices are great, but the flash discounts are out of control. And a flash discount, again, it's a limited time. So you have to book while the discount is in effect, and then you could take advantage of that great price. Okay? Now, anything over $500, any order over $500 will ship for free, so don't worry about that. And you get great prices, an excellent inventory, and it's all there at magrents.com. And lastly, let's just quickly talk about Shutterstock.com. Shutterstock, of course, they have images, they've got footage, they've got music, all sorts of stuff in there. But one of their new features is called Shutterstock Select. Now, these are cinema quality clips created by industry pros, and they're all captured in up to 8K on red cameras and more. This is really the best of the best of the best, and it's all there at Shutterstock.com. Click on Footage. Scroll down to Shutterstock Select, and you will be faced with thousands of cinema quality clips created by industry pros. This is something to definitely check out. Yes, the prices are a little bit more than the other footage, but wow, do you get what you pay for. And when it comes to your own work, you want to make sure that the footage that you select to accompany the work that you've done for yourself is of the highest quality. And i got to tell you guys, Shutterstock Select is the highest quality. So go check it out at Shutterstock.com. How much did you draw from Maplethorpe's own art? And also, who else did you draw from to give you that really great 70s, 80s, and even 60s look of New York? We really didn't draw on Maplethorpe's work itself. So it was really about the time period the colors of the time, and, and that people were shooting in film. Go, uh, Nan Golden and her book, in particular, The Battle of Sexual Dependency, was a big reference. Uh, but we looked at many street photographers of New York at the time and uh, went beyond the lookbooks that both Andy and I had into a very extensive research that Jonah did. And I would just spend hours in that room soaking it in, yeah. getting it into my psyche. And uh, I would go in this room when things got crazy out in the production office because we were always under budget constraints and time constraints and trying to get the shooting schedule manageable. So Andy had to cut many scenes. Uh, and uh, when I signed on, there were 20 days and then um, <laughs> we lost one <laughs> before we started. Usually people are getting more when they run over, but um, you know, I pride myself on staying in time and on budget. So you had this this place where you could go to really keep yourself on track with what the look of this film is going to be. It sounds like you, it was like your little moment of solace where you can go, go and enjoy these uh, reference images and get exactly. yourself on track. Um, I want to talk about <clears throat> this film, you know, chronicles Robert's entire journey and he changes a lot. Yeah. I mean, he starts as a young, aspiring, fresh faced guy and not even doing photography and then transitions into kind of this reflective, almost jaded, um, you know, post-fame type of photographer and artist. And I'd love, you know, it, it, I, you could feel the difference, certainly in the performance, but also in the look of it. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering the approach that you took to kind of showcase all of those different types of, you know, all those different moments in his life. Right. So the film starts off very warm and yet on the monochromatic side when Robert is coming up in New York, uh, and it got more color as Robert, well, I should say, when Robert grew up in Queens, and then he uh, went to Pratt, and he's just getting his feet wet into the Manhattan lifestyle. Yeah. So uh, it was on the warm side, but monochromatic. As Patty entered his life, and he moved into the Chelsea, we added more warmth, and uh, there was more color. Um, as he got famous, uh, 
I desaturated both in color of light. Uh, certainly, Jonah Markowitz's sets, if you will, I and mean, we were on location, uh, kept the cool, again, mostly monochromatic look of his life at the time. Uh, he was making money, but there was a life being drained out of him, i.e. the color yeah. he felt should be drained out. So if you look at Robert's studio on 23rd Street, where uh, he ended his life, basically, uh, a lot of windows, a lot of light, and yet very blue and white or black and white almost. Yeah, stark. It was stark, yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> that was one of the few locations we actually had in Manhattan. It was in the mid 30s. Uh, and you could look out the window and see older buildings. Um, my problem was we were on the 14th floor, so I couldn't bring any light in from outside. And I really had to use the movement of the sun to determine which order to shoot and, uh, you know, where the sun would be hitting uh, in the windows yeah. and the buildings across the street. Uh, and then uh, we would close or cover some of the windows so I could create some negative fill, if you will, so it wasn't overlit. Um, it was also our first week it was big. And the reason it had to be the first week uh, we were shooting out of order because Robert, I mean, because, excuse me, um, Matt Smith had to lose a lot of weight yeah. to play Robert dying of age. Yes. So he uh, could barely eat weeks before and uh, during production as well on that first week. So we shot backwards. And that must have been challenging for Matt. And uh, he he pulled it off. There's one scene, and he's dying, he's in bed, and Patty comes to visit him. And uh, Matt's supposed to be in great pain. And he looked at the camera gear and asked my ACs for some knobs and metal pieces he could put under his body to try to <laughs> help with feeling the pain as he moved around. He would have these wow. sharp objects um, underneath him on, in bed. Um, I want to also mention that my camera crew were all women. So I was the director of photography operator. Jill Tufts, who's actually from Boston, where you're from, yeah, uh, was my first AC. She works in commercials and works a lot with Errol Morris and has children. But because we shot in the summer of 2017, um, she was able to come down to New York. Uh, her husband took care of the kids when they weren't in camp. And uh, she was a wonderful focus puller. I had a second AC named Yvonne Varna. Uh, we stole her off of Blue Bloods. So it was shooting in New York. And we found this amazing film loader that Ed Lockman wanted to know about because it's very hard. Yeah, to who's find. a film loader right now? <laughs> Although exactly. maybe, it, maybe it's changing. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot changing. happening in film. There's a lot happening in film. It is not dead. It's a choice. So this woman, Kira Killfeather, was our film loader. We never had dirt or scratches, which is something... Uh, uh, <laughs> amazing because yeah. 16 millimeter was always subject to dirt and scratches and she was so organized uh it was really wonderful for not only me but the producers the, her paperwork as well as her film was clean it was great so there we were all women which we felt was uh wonderful and we had a woman director and this was all before me too, and, you know, time's up. Uh, but I've always supported working with women. I know how hard it was for me when I was coming up as an electrician and gaffer, actually harder when I began, began shooting. Uh, Why do you feel that way? Because I had men 
gaffers or DPs to hire me when I was coming up in the electric department. But when I started shooting, I think there was this feeling of risk, like, wow, women, why they, they're not doing that. You know, who's doing that? And I actually had to raise money and make my own documentary because the only women shooting at the time were doing documentaries. Really? So even though I came up in narrative and commercials, I taught myself documentary shooting. Uh, and uh, So people felt that it was a risk to hire you just well, because I you're a woman? I can't imagine how hard. Yes, it was a different time. Uh, I had a, an agent at the time, you know, people were sending out three quarter inch videos of our work. There was no, no, no internet. No. Uh, and uh, my agent stuck a little piece of paper in the tape uh, just to check. And it would often the, 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 Cassettes would come back, and the little tab of paper was still stuck in there, so they clearly hadn't even looked at my oh, work. So, yeah, so you knew they didn't even see it. Right. So it was a very difficult time and frustrating for me, but I, I really feel that cinematography is and lighting, certainly, it's not gender-based. Uh, the Broadway theater was full of women lighting designers at the time, but filmmaking was extremely close to women in the technical areas. And I know I raised a lot of eyebrows when I was shooting coming to set with a woman first AC. Uh, I can only imagine looking back uh, how the agencies, you know, this is on commercials, felt, you know, when they saw the two of us. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, I do think we it's, take it for granted? It's great that that happened. It's great that you did that. And back in February, 2017, you were the recipient of the ASC's president's award. That's the first time a woman ever received that award. And as great of a, of an honor that is, I'm like, wh why was that the first time? <laughs> why was February, 2017, the first time? It's so weird to me. Like it, it like when I, when I, hear about these milestones. I love it. I think it's great. But part of me is also like, that's kind of gross that it took this long for that to happen. Right. Even um, when I got into the ASC, there were two other women that got in that same year, making the total of four ever. And then a fifth came in. Alan Curis came in the year after. And, you know, our ranks have grown to we're about 15 now of 300. So it's still pretty low and uh, depressing. People don't uh, know it because you guys are behind the scenes. Like, you just don't know it. Right. You know, when people talk about uh, more male leads than female leads or more lines being read by male leads than female leads, you can see it. It's there. You buy tickets to the show. You see it. You don't know who's shooting the film. Most people right. don't care. But I think knowing that there's such a you know, the, the, there's such a um, imbalance in genders behind the camera is really weird. And uh, yeah. it's like, what what do you think needs to happen for the film industry to just <laughs> to get to a point where it's not we have a female cinematographer and it's just a cinematographer? Like, <laughs> when does that shift? Okay, well, I've thought a lot about this over the years, and it really goes back to how the next generation is raising the children. Because if you raise your children in a non-gender-based way, uh, you will hopefully have adults that are open to the possibilities for all human beings, no matter race, religion, sexual preference, gender. Um, it's going to take a while. Now, certainly there are mandates. Uh, I am on a series that is created by women right now. Every woman coming in, there are eight episodes, is a woman director. And uh, the showrunner is a woman. I have 
men, I'm half and half in my camera crew, women and men. We have people of color. Uh, and uh, both the uh, grip and electric departments have gotten very diverse. So there is a recognition that we have to give people opportunity and uh, there are mandates now, legal, you know, uh, that uh, some studios are really pushing to employ. But there's a lot of resentment sometimes, I feel. And, you know, the white males have felt very threatened, which is too bad because white males still outnumber the women and, you know, diverse elements of people uh, by a good 80%. So, but nonetheless, we are all human beings and uh, we just have to be able to embrace our differences and know that we need to give people who haven't had opportunities the opportunity to prove themselves. I think people get nervous and I can, I can see it. I can understand what someone being nervous when they start hearing about mandates and they'll, they'll, I can see somebody naturally making the leap to saying, well, it, it, it somebody that, that is less qualified will get this position that I deserve because of mm-hmm. a mandate. Now, as right. ridiculous as that is, I can see somebody leaping to that uh, conclusion. But my question is, is it simply that there isn't as many f- women behind the scenes or do you feel, because you're in the industry way more than I am. I mean, I'm doing commercial work here in Boston, so I know what the scene's like here. But right. out in the stuff that you're doing, is there just less in the field uh, to choose from? And the reason I'm asking is because we've been doing, we do a lot of work with um, higher education. And right. there's a huge push to get more um, young women, girls uh, involved in STEM. Um, right. And the thought is we need to inspire And, you know, we need to inspire these young women to get involved in these things so that the pool is more even. Um, That's true. And do you feel like it's the same way? Like, are we seeing that film schools don't have as many women as men? Uh, They do. Film schools have. That's what that's what I want to get to the root of, because I'm curious, like, because I don't know the world that you're in. um, Mm -hmm. And I'd love to get your opinion on opinion on that. Okay, so the film schools are now I will just speak from cinematography. The departments are split half and half, and sometimes there are even more women. Hmm. When women get out of school, they have many fewer opportunities than the men. You see this in directing too. Uh, a woman director might get the first film, but to get the second one, very, very difficult. Even, you know, if, uh, if this woman is a winner at Sundance or any of the other big festivals, uh, and you see males getting that second film, you know, a big blockbuster, even though they've done a small indie. This just doesn't happen for women. So back to the cinematographers, it's very frustrating. We have a tremendous number of women camera assistants. Now, when I started, women camera assistants were a rarity and were looked upon. You know, people also didn't trust that they could keep the lenses in focus. If you can imagine, I mean, I know I have some, an old friend who's a cinematographer now who was an AC. And I remember the actress not trusting her on a movie to be able to keep her in focus. I mean, just the attitudes have changed since the 80s. However, when you try to step up from camera assistant to operator and DP, it's been very tough in Hollywood. Now, the independent scene has a lot of cinematographers that are women now, fortunately, and uh, that is encouraging. But to get a break and to make a living... Many of my cinematography students that I've mentored have had to go into reality television to pay the bills. I find that actually is a great training because there's so much handheld now uh, in television. And so they get a terrific training like I did in documentaries when I had to teach myself handheld shooting. Then I went into music videos and 
there was a lot of handheld shooting M35 millimeter, but uh, there was still 16 Super 8. Um, so, uh, but the, it's a tough time still. And uh, then there is the child rearing issue. Some women want to have children. It has not always been uh, accepted, especially when women are pregnant, that they can work. Uh, and now today we do have women working to the eighth month. You see it on sets more, but it wasn't always like that. And it still raises some eyebrows and uh, there is some quiet discrimination. Uh, now, when the women take time off, there isn't a lot of time for uh, support when they're trying to be with their babies. They may take a couple of years off and then find it difficult to get back into the market. Yeah. So there are certainly difficulties, even though men today are so much more involved in uh, sharing the child rearing duties, still mostly the women uh, who bear the brunt of the responsibility and the joys to the day-to-day joys. There is an awesome DP here in Boston, Nikki Bramley. She does, she'll AC too, because you kind of yeah. have to wear all hats around this area. Um, but she worked all through her pregnancy. Right. It, it was incredible. And, um, you know, it, she's just super talented anyway. So I was glad to not have to lose her. I, I was right. like, when I heard she got pregnant, I was kind of like, oh man, she's going to be out of the business for a while, but not the case at all. No. And, uh, right. It, you know, it was it was refreshing and empowering, and I really love that um, that she was able to maintain through that whole process. And then when you're when you're there and you're working with you, you're like, I can't even believe this was a concern. It's just yeah. so silly, right? Um, but yeah, but it's, it's in the culture. It is in the culture. And then uh, you know, not to get too political, but oh, get political, Nancy. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> you know, our country does not support healthcare. Overall, but certainly maternity leave and paternity leave, even my union needs to step up the support for men and women uh, having children. So the country has to change. Our unions have to change. And uh, it's just uh, bit by bit, we have to push for massive changes. And yet it starts with how you rear, read, you know, you rear your kids. Um, I grew up at a time when there weren't that as certainly as many women working in the workplace. My mother didn't work. She was an art dealer part time when uh, my dad passed away. But, uh, you know, it wasn't as common. And today, at least the children growing up have working parents, both of them. And uh, so that's certainly allowed the possibility in women's head, you know, brains that they can accomplish as much as their male counterparts. So yet uh, in many fields, not just in filmmaking um, and, uh, you know, even in commercials, you know, we really have to, Notice that when the money, the stakes are high, women don't get the same opportunities as men. They just don't. Uh, And uh, I have always marveled at how many women are in documentaries producing and directing for decades. The stakes are lower. The money is lower. And yet the work is harder less money to do the same amount of work. Uh, You know, I see it on my small indies that I do for friends, many women directors, uh, and, uh, you know, fewer days and uh, less money, and yet we have to make the same length movie as a big-budget Hollywood movie. Do you think when somebody like Rachel Morrison comes around, Mm-hmm. And everyone now knows her name, right? And she's doing big, huge movies, right? Do you think that that? Do you think that that turns into something like, okay, we've got one, we've solved the problem, it's done, no need to worry about it anymore, nothing to see here anymore. Rachel Morrison's out there, she's doing well, she did a big, huge blockbuster. We've solved the problem. 
I mean, do you see that in the film industry or do oh, you feel like she's right. really broken doors down and there is a sea change? Cause I really hope there is. No, I don't. I mean, it's great that Rachel has gotten so much acclaim. She's an amazing human being, not just a talent. So it's thrilling, but it's a tokenism of what is out there. There are plenty of talented women cinematographers who just need an opportunity to have a movie that's seen. If Mudbound had not been put out by Netflix, I don't know who would have seen it. She yeah. would never have gotten that acclaim and that nomination. Netflix put the money behind that movie and people saw it. And not also for D. Reese, the director. Now, I know many very talented women cinematographers who shoot small indies and they never get released. There's nobody like Netflix or HBO, you know, pushing. So it's a really challenging time uh, for independent films. We were lucky with Maplethorpe that it even got theatrical release. Uh, you know, so many films don't. I mean, you look at Roma. Yeah. Look what Netflix did. Nobody would have seen that black and white movie. Yeah. So it's, a, again, about the money, and it's a lot of luck. You have to just be lucky. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Creative Dreamer by Teeny Music. is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. Head over to premiumbeat.com to access a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as 59 bucks each. You don't just get the track either. You get loop sets, you get cut downs, you get stems. And what that means is you have all the customization ability to make sure that the track that you love fits your project perfectly. So check it out. It's all there, including this song, Creative Dreamer by Teeny Music, over at premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about Rule Boston Camera. Yes, Rule Boston Camera is the place to purchase and rent all of your production equipment because they have the best service in the industry. They really do. When you rent from Rule, you honestly feel like they are your partner in this project. And it's just the reality. I mean, production is mission critical. They understand that and they have your back. So you're going to get expert advice and counsel in pre-production. You're going to get technical guidance when you take the equipment out for your shoot. And they're committed to support you throughout that whole thing. So really what it comes down to is peace of mind. And that's what you want when you're renting equipment. That's what you want when you're on set. Last thing you want to have to worry about is your equipment. So you're going to have a world-class inventory over at Rule Boston Camera. Cameras, audio, lighting, grip, communications, camera dynamics, the best of the best, and a lot of it. You're going to get a huge selection of lenses, that's for sure. And you're going to get the peace of mind knowing that everybody over at Rule is there to support you 100%. Before you even leave with your equipment, you're going to know everything you need to know about it, and you'll feel like you are supported. And you would be supported. I mean, that's what Rule Boston Camera is all about. So you go to rule.com, check out their inventory. You can buy, you can rent, and you can also learn, which is another way that they support our production industry. Uh, they're really a resource for how-to learning events, demos and workshops, video and community news. It's all there at rule.com. Click on learn, and that's exactly what you'll do. You'll learn, and you'll check out their calendar for all their upcoming events. And wow, they've got a lot of them, including on May 3rd to the 5th, Reducation Workshop at Rule Boston Camera, Learn all about the red camera workflow, uh, but there's always events going on. So if you missed that one, have no fear, but that's happening on May 3rd to the 5th, 2019 over at Rule Boston Camera in Boston. All right, it's time for our conclusion to our interview with Nancy Schreiber. So now in our last few minutes, I'd love to just get a little bit of advice from you for the people out there in the audience um, you know, anybody interested in the film industry, but since we're on the topic specifically to women, 
that want to get right. into the filmmaking industry, become cinematographers, become gaffers and get into it. What do you suggest that they do? What's some advice? Well, the first bit of advice I have would be you have to have the passion when I started, and to this day, I cannot think of anything I'd rather do besides this. Yeah, sure, I, you know, there are certain uh, hobbies that I do, but I have a great passion for this. And I am in my element when I'm on set. It is my happy place. Women have to be so passionate that they don't want to do anything else and give up because the obstacles are there. And yet, if you look at the obstacles, if I had looked at how difficult it was, I wouldn't be talking to you today and on a series, it's now March, I'm here till July. That is a blessing. I count my blessings every time I'm hired because it is not easy and it's so competitive, especially with the digital resolution and anybody being able to pick up a camera and uh, make make a film. So, uh, you know, especially if you have money and can buy a camera, you can call yourself a cinematographer. So, you know, I never take for granted any work I have. So number one, be grateful for any opportunity you, you have. Number two, take risks. Get out and shoot for free if you have another way to pay the rent. You meet people, you get experience. Number three, find a way to have a balance in your life. Because even though I am so passionate and driven to keep shooting, if I didn't have balance through art and music and my friends and cooking and you know just traveling, uh, I wouldn't be as good of a cinematographer. I need life experiences to fuel me. So uh, it's not just women, it's people of color, people uh, with different sexual orientations. We need to see that we are all human beings with innate talents that just have to be developed and take chances, take risks, and uh, don't give up. I love it. I love it. Nancy, thank you so much for being on the Go Creative Show. Um, where can people go online to find out more about you? Well, I have a website, www.nancyschreiber.com. That's N-A-N-C-Y-S-C-H-R-E-I-B-E-R.com. And Instagram is Nancy Schreiber underscore A-S-C. Yeah, Nancy, your stuff is fantastic. Follow oh, her thanks. Instagram um, and check out her website. You've got a lot of great work up there. We talked about, you know, we talked about, um, uh, oh, my God, I'm losing my mind, Maplethorpe. But right. there's so much more over there. So dig into well, her catalog I, and check out the other films because you will be happy you did. And by the way, for some of the oldsters out there, uh, I just finished a documentary on the singer Linda Ronstadt, which no just way. Is Right. Premiering at Tribeca in April. I'm unfortunately going to be down here in Atlanta, happy to be shooting. Um, that doesn't but, sound unfortunate. <laughs> no, I'm happy, believe me. But, uh, yeah. you know, take a look for the documentary. It's really, again, a history of the 70s in particular in uh, Los Angeles in particular, in the music scene. And uh, she was really the first woman to break into large arena um, um, performing for a woman. She was the first. Uh, the Eagles were her backup band. So I just saying, that. That's check so it cool. out. Yeah. Uh, what's so, the name uh, of it? I don't know. You don't know what the title is? It's yet? just, well... Probably, oh, sound of my, I don't know, because they're just finishing post. All right, but, well, uh, it'll be about the Linda, Linda Ronstadt documentary that's right. new and, that everybody's going to be excited about. That's the one you want to see, people. And, oh, I have to say one other thing about uh, coming up in the business. I just worked all night. I went to bed at 7 a.m. So first of all, forgive me if I have not made sense in my sentences. No but, apology needed. We're glad that you stayed up for us. <laughs> 
Definitely. But uh, the, for those wanting to be in the business, know that you have to work some pretty crazy uh, hours. And it was freezing even here in Atlanta last night. So, uh, you know, you just have to give it up and just know that you're being with this great family of film people. Uh, it's really an exciting life and it's never boring. That's for sure. Well, don't ever stop, Nancy. We need you out thank there fighting the good fight and doing the great you. work that you're doing. Nancy Schreiber, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun and uh, congratulations on your show. I love it. Thank you. There she goes, Nancy Schreiber. Thank you so much for being on, Nancy. Your film is awesome. I love Maplethorpe. Of course, I want to also thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gainstructure.com, gainstructure.com, and on Twitter, at gainstructure. And you can follow us all over the place now, at Go Creative Show on Twitter, at Go Creative Show on Instagram, at Go Creative Show on Facebook. There is no reason why you can't follow us and enjoy the show. Uh, all the great things that are happening outside of the show. It's all there at gocreativeshow.com as well. Of course, I want to thank our sponsors, Hedge.Video, Rule Boston Camera, Magnanimous Rentals, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. That would stink. So please support those that support us. Oh, and don't forget the survey. You could win a $100 gift card. 